Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your host, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello, and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, Austin Davidson. Hey, yo. It's season three, episode 52 the Pittsburgh Steelers traveling to Jacksonville to hopefully exercise some of their demons from last season against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Last year, the Jaguars defeated the Pittsburgh Steelers both in week five, during which Ben Roethlisberger threw five interceptions in a 30-9 to loss, and again in the divisional round of the playoffs, shocking the Steelers at home. Uh, everyone thought the Steelers were going to be the better team there, but the Jaguars jumped out to a 21 to nothing lead and then later 28 to 7 on en route to a 45 to 42 victory. Quite a lot has changed for both teams since then, or at least the Jaguars are concerned. And we'll get into that momentarily. But there was a game played Thursday night. Let's talk a little bit about that first. The Packers fall again. They lose another tough road game in Seattle. 27-24, to 24. did you get a chance to watch the game at all? Uh, very little, but uh, what I did see was that uh, Devontae Adams continued to go off. He had 10 receptions for 166 yards, and, uh, man, the Packers are just bad. The Packers are just really, really bad. I think, I can't remember the statistic exactly, but I think it's been eight or, like, nine years since they won in Seattle. Like, it's been a very long time since they actually uh, beat in Seattle in their own home. Not to mention, I, a lot of talk is a lot of people have been talking about the Packers and who to put the blame on. I, I don't know if you've delved into that conversation at all, but I know that there's plenty of blame to go around. You can talk about a couple weeks ago the Ty Montgomery decision, the fumble. This time, uh, some heats being levied against Mike McCarthy for not going for it on fourth and two from their own. I believe it was 28 yard line, down by three with like four minutes to go and instead they punted the ball I I probably would have punted it too but I can understand why you would have gone for it there I don't know uh do you think the criticism is fair I mean you got Aaron Rodgers it's it's the same thing that why people were mad at the Ty Montgomery thing it's like Ty Montgomery should have listened and given Aaron Rodgers a chance if you give Aaron Rodgers four downs, likely he's getting it. I mean, Aaron Jones went off in that game, too. Even if you're giving it to Aaron Jones, likely he's getting it. I don't know. I think I think I would have done it. Cause, uh, I, I think with the, the way that team is, their defense isn't very good. I would have just gone for it with four minutes to go. Because, I mean, you could also kill the rest of the clock by, uh, since you're going for your own 28. So that's what I think. You know, it, it... Either way, your defense is going to have to make a stop, and I guess you're playing between the Seahawks definitely running the ball, you know, three times to try to end the game if you punt it, or maybe they run it twice and try to throw it to the end zone on third down if uh, if you go for it and don't get it. I, I'm not sure. I think hindsight is 2020 in that instance, but. The thing that we can agree on is that the Packers have not been a very good football team since winning seven straight games. I believe it was seven or six. It was six straight games at the end of the 2016 season. The Packers have not been a very good football team. And I believe Aaron Rodgers deserves some criticism, but I think at the end of the day, I think the rest of the team is just not very good. And I don't think it's very, it's orchestrated very well. And I think it might be time for Mike, Mike McCarthy to find work elsewhere. Hmm. What are your thoughts? Well, I think Mike McCarthy, I think that team has always been based too much on Aaron Rodgers. It's always been on uh, Aaron Rodgers to make things happen. Always on Aaron Rodgers to lead the comebacks. And the team is just like talentless regardless, uh, besides that. I mean, they got Devontae Adams and they got Aaron Jones, who are also pretty good. But like defense they don't really have those stars like they it was Mike Daniels I mean I guess they got Kenny Clark but like they don't really have anyone on defense like wow that guy's a leader that guy's like really good like every team needs that I just I don't know I feel like it's a team that's based way too much on uh how Aaron Rodgers is performing and because he's having a down year this year his completion percentage is way low 
the rest of the team is failing. And I, I don't know if, if that's on Mike McCarthy, but uh, it probably is time for him to go because I feel like the Packers have always had these like mediocre esque games where they're like they go back and forth and how good they are, and it's always based on how Aaron Rodgers is performing. So maybe it's time to move on, or maybe even it's time to move on from their uh, their their GM because whoever's like doing the drafting and uh, they haven't really brought, they've never been a team to bring in free agents. That's probably the problem. So maybe it's time to get rid of that. Uh, oh wait, the Packers don't have a GM, do they? No, they don't have an owner. I'm sorry. I'm I'm actually I'm actually stupid right now. Uh, just uh, uh, actually, now that I think about it, how does that work? Did, is there like a council for the the Packers? Who fires? Who does firings and who does hirings? If, um, when they don't have an owner, they're I think, owned by multiple people. I think there's someone in football operations, but let's not. We, we can figure that out on our own time. Uh, I, I am curious about it, but let's uh, let's uh, move on. <laughs> sure. Uh, the one bit of news to take away from that game: Jimmy Graham broke his thumb on Thursday night. Is he expected to miss any time? I didn't see anything yet. There was the one tweet from Adam Schefter that said that he's gonna he was getting tests that day, and then I never saw anything ever again. So I'm not actually even sure at this point. It's possible he might only miss one game, but you never know with someone like a tight end that's going to be using those hands, he might miss some time. Uh, the Baltimore Ravens, some news out of uh, out of their camp just recently. Lamar Jackson and Robert Griffin III are going to be splitting snaps at quarterback while Joe Flacco is going to be out. I really don't understand this. Uh, are they both going to be on the field at the same time, or is it just going to be like one quarter it's Lamar Jackson, the next it's Robert Griffin the third. I'm very confused. I'm confused as well. I mean, you you took this guy in the first round. He should be starting. Robert Griffin is there for your veteran leadership and uh, just another guy just in case Joe Flacco got hurt as a backup. Like, this shouldn't be happening. Like, I, I can't believe that they're going to be doing that stupid stuff with Lamar Jackson with RG3 on the field. RG3 might be doing what Lamar Jackson was doing behind Joe Flacco. I, I don't... Honestly, no. I think that they are losing it a little. I, I, I think they should just be. I mean, maybe it's wrong to throw their rookie out there to try, but I mean, it's just one game. Let Lamar Jackson start. He's a first rounder. You drafted him for a reason. It's, it's his time. Let's, let's see it. I, I don't know why they're even letting RG3 uh, have half the playing time. If I'm being honest with you. If Lamar Jackson is not ready now, is he, is he realistically going to be ready this year? Because if you're not going to start him at this point and play him, like, completely, when would you until, like, next season? Yeah, it's really late in the season. Like, all the other first-round rookies have uh, gotten some playing time, at least minimally, and most of them, I believe, have started. So, like, uh, actually, I think they all started, if I, if I am correct, besides Lamar Jackson. So, like, it's, it's time. Like, he, there's nothing more he can learn this season. I mean... He's redshirted enough. Ten games, uh, I mean nine games, is a, is a lot of time to uh, to really learn the system, see what's wrong with what Joe Flacco is doing wrong, and build on it. I mean, I think it's just it's time to let him loose. And if he's bad, he's bad. I mean, you made a, uh, people draft mistakes all the time in the first round, but just you gotta let him go. Yeah, I, I mean, RG three should really be the in case of emergency kind of guy, but. Then again, who knows, maybe it's just a ploy or something like that. Uh, something that isn't a ploy is uh, Blake Bortles at quarterback, or maybe it is. I always thought that the, the Jaguars should have drafted Lamar Jackson and should have groomed him to eventually replace Bortles, but the Jaguars decided to stick with Bortles, and he's getting a lot of criticism in Jacksonville, and maybe some of it deserving, maybe some of it not. The Jaguars in 2018 have been a far cry from what they were last season. And uh, for those who might remember, I brought my friend Josh Farnsworth on the show the other day to talk a little bit about the Jaguars and kind of the differences between this year's team and last year's team and why they're underachieving compared to where they were last year. And I want you guys to take a listen to uh, a short clip of what he was talking about as far as that team goes. So uh, without further ado, here's Josh Farnsworth. I think there's a few things that you could really point your finger on. Uh, there's been um, uh, an outstanding amount of injuries. Uh, 
I think there's a total of 16 players on the IR. Um, you know, one of them is your, uh, you know, star-studded offensive line. You have Linder that just hit the IR this past week. Um, Cam Robinson um, hitting the IR uh, back um, shortly after the uh, the Patriots game. Um, and uh, his replacement, Wells, went down shortly after that. <laughs> and then, uh, so yeah, it's just been a rotational um, door at, at the offensive line. And then, of course, you throw in, um, you know, the, the heart of your offense, uh, Fournette. He had that um, injury to his uh, hamstring in, the, in game one and uh, came back against the Jets and played, you know, a couple series, but really wasn't himself. Uh, we finally got him back last week, and he looks like he's, you know, back at his normal form. But um, as far as uh, a difference between the two teams, 2017 and 2018, I think you really – point your finger at the defense um you know if you go back and you watch the way that they played last year they played a lot of man and then um you know throw the uh the four-man rush at the you know the quarterback and try to see you know if you can you know get those picks but this year it seems like they're they're playing you know um, on their heels a little bit more uh, playing zone a lot more and uh when you have the clientele like what they have on defense uh, i think it's it's a you know a serious problem when you're when you're playing zone when you have a defense that's designed to play man. Um, they haven't been getting the sacks, uh, the pressure on the quarterback. Um, of course, I think um, uh, to a degree the tight ends have been just absolutely killing us this year. Uh, 300 yards in the first half this past game against the Colts, um, and 29 points in the first half. You just you can't overcome that. And when the defense is just that porous, um, you're going to look bad. And the offense, you know, the pressure is going to fall on the offense. And you won't be running the ball. You can't keep to your identity. And I think a lot of uh, people like to point their finger at Blake Bortles and, you know, blame him for, you know, the, the lack of um, big play or, you know, um, you know, the points that, you know, is expected like what he played against the Patriots but um you know if you go back and you take a look they were a little bit more disciplined as far as you know um, that west coast style offense keeping it to that instead of trying to force the, you know force the, the ball down the field and you know uh, to an extent I think you can also point your fingers at the the wide receiver um we're actually uh tied for second in the league in drops. Um, Kalen Cole does not play to the expectation that you would really expect from a guy who is expected to be number, you know, the number one receiver on the team. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a total turnaround, and <laughs> you just don't know what to expect with this Jaguar team. You, you know, they show up one week, and then, you know, they really haven't shown up a lot over the last couple, you know, last five games, but... You know, um, I think uh, going into this game, the one thing that you do have to watch for is, uh, you know, they're starting to get healthy um, on the defensive side. Um, I know uh, Smith, he's been uh, playing hurt with his shoulder. Um, Ramsey's been playing hurt with his knee. And uh, Bouye actually had a, an issue with his, um, I believe it was his ankle. But, um, yeah, it looks like he's going to be, all, you know, um, all good to go this week. Uh, Aiden in the slot, and that's another thing you can take a close look at. Last year we had Aaron Coleman in the slot, and he, he was primarily um, somebody who covered the tight end, and we just haven't had that as far as um, you know, um, you know, covering the tight end. But uh, overall, I think that we're starting to mesh. But you know, last week in the second half against the Colts, they really pulled it together and didn't allow any points in the second half and um you know came back and almost almost put themselves in a position to tie it up but uh the fumble at the end of the game actually just completely you know ruined the comeback but they had that feel like the 2017 i think they're starting to get their wheels under them but um i think it's a little you know too late um but you know if they do start picking up wins here and there uh they could possibly see, you know, a, um, a point
playoff chance, but it's very slim at this point. All right, so a lot, a lot Josh talked about right there. I know there's a lot of things to sift through, but what were your some of your takeaways from that? I mean, it sounds to me like it, it's just kind of the perfect storm for the Jaguars, where it's just everything that could have gone wrong has gone wrong. Yeah, one of the biggest things for me, though, is actually them not using man and sticking to zone. I, I agree with Josh. I mean, I, I he would know better because he watched more Jaguars games than me, but they are definitely more of a man team, like on paper. They just look like a, a team that can run it, and they should be. So if they're using a zone system, that's basically them shooting themselves in the foot. Like, I feel like they just have the speed to run man all the time, and they have the talent on defense to be like that, especially with uh, their defensive line I mean, this, that, this is another problem. Their defensive line isn't hitting hard like it used to. Maybe that's forcing them into the zone because they used to be getting a pass rush without sending blitzes. Like, uh, the Steelers last season were one of the highest blitzing teams and were, had the most sacks. I don't remember where the Jaguars were, but they were not in the top five, and they were second with one less sack than the Steelers uh, with 55 last year. Uh, and that was without obviously without blitzing, so they could run man easier. I don't know. I, it seems like... Seems like, like you said, it's a perfect storm of problems that they had. Injuries that hurt them really bad. Like they lost Marquise Lee before the season even started, and that's contributed to their wide receiver problem because Marquise Lee was their number one wide receiver, in my opinion. But uh, regardless, uh, what did you think of what Josh had to say? Yeah, I, I mean, I think he's he's right on the money, and you know, their offense, as we know, it's not it's not a one trick pony per se. But they, their success comes from the ground game. The ground game is the key to everything else that happens on that offense. You know, the offensive line, the injuries there, they have four offensive linemen on IR. It's just really hard to produce consistently when you have that many key guys on injured reserve. So you're losing a lot of power up front. And then obviously Fournette is a dynamic run back, one of the more most physical running backs in the NFL. He's he's played sparingly this season. You know, he he did play last week and he started to get his feet under him a little bit. But at the same time, like without him, it's clear that the offense is just not the same. TJ TJ Yeldon has been solid. He's a good pass catching guy. He can get to the outside. But this Jaguars team is all about pounding it up the gut, and that's what Leonard Fournette does best. And without him, they just it's almost like they've lacked an identity on offense. And Blake Bortles has had trouble. And again, it's not necessarily his fault, by the way, but he hasn't had the best season ever. But, you know, I think the criticism criticism on him is a little unfair because his numbers right now are just about where he is normally for his career. So he hasn't been terrible. And then as far as the defense goes, I really don't have anything else that's much different from what you were saying. It, they're really putting themselves at, dis at a disadvantage if they're using – zone schemes more often than man you just said they're they're much better actually both of you said they're better equipped to handle offenses with man coverage perhaps they're worried about their safeties I do know for a fact that Telvin Smith has been dealing with injuries this year and so has Barry Church or at least Barry Church has just been underperforming those are two guys that are key in covering running backs and athletic tight ends. If they're worried about putting those guys in man coverage, it could be why we're seeing a lot of a lot more zone from the Jaguars. But either way, that doesn't account for needing to overuse it and thus hurting your defensive strength, which is athleticism, letting those guys cover in man on man coverage, and then, you know, just getting after the quarterback with the four man pass rush. It's it was it's a scary four man front it was last year you know you had F Dante Fowler who granted never amounted quite to what everyone thought he was going to be in Jacksonville but he was still solid you had Ngakwe who was who was getting better you had Calais Campbell who was really good one of the best defensive players in the league last year and of course Malik Jackson who hadn't been great but he was still a force and you had Marcel Darius too and i mean that's just that's a tough front four and even without Fowler, it's just it's such a strange oddity that they only have, I believe it was, what, 20 sacks this year, 19 sacks this year, far off the pace of the 55 that they had last year. And for the most part, it's the same guys. So it's just, it's one of those weird things where, again, like, like, like we all said, it's kind of like the perfect storm of problems for them. And I just, I think it's very bizarre. But again, on paper, this is very similar to the team 
that we saw back in January. There are there are some injuries, but they are starting to get healthy in key areas. I I think there I don't think there's a reason to believe that this is going to be a cakewalk. Uh, I, I'm sure you don't see it that way, or you see it that way too, right? Uh, no, there's no way that this is going to be a cakewalk. It's still going to be a rough game. And uh, these games were both physical last year, and physical games, as we know, can take a toll on you in the injury uh, in the injury dynamic. And the Steelers have two players that are injured this week, so relatively healthy going into this game, but both of the players that are going to be out are key. Marcus Gilbert, the offensive tackle, is going to miss another game. And uh, I, I don't know when – I thought this was going to be the game he'd come back, but I guess it's not. And now Stefan Tuitt hyperextended his elbow. It's the same injury Mike Hilton suffered earlier this season. He missed one game. So hopefully Tuitt will return soon. But those are two tough losses. And then the Jaguars have a ton of different injuries. Cornerback Quentin Meeks uh, is out with a knee injury. Offensive lineman Josh Walker and defensive tackle Eli Anko are both doubtful. Uh, with foot and calf injuries, which means offensive tackle Eric Flowers, formerly of the New York Giants, who was cut earlier this year, is going to get a, get the start. So, uh, man, oh man, if if you want to have any indication of how how rough their season is going, that that should tell you right there. And uh, they have a few other injuries, including one to Marcel Darius. He's questionable. And Ike, how do you say that name? Uh. It is, uh, wait, which, which name? I'm confused. Oh, it's, it's just, I'm sorry. The, it was just a mistype. It's AJ Can. I was confused. I was like looking, I was like, where's there an Ike? <laughs> uh, it's just AJ Can. Okay. So the Jaguars have a few injuries of their own too. And again, uh, they're all over the place, but you've got several offensive linemen right there and you got a couple defensive linemen too. Controlling the trenches is going to be important in this game, as it typically is between these two teams. Darius was not a participant in practice on Friday, so pay attention to his availability on Sunday. So the Steelers and Jaguars, they played twice last season. The Jaguars now hold a 14-11 to advantage in the all-time series. Uh, the most recent result, obviously, coming back in January, the Jaguars came away with a 45-42 to victory in the divisional round. The Jaguars pushed their postseason record against Pittsburgh to 2-0. and And a fun fact for today, the Steelers and Jaguars have played in two overtime games against each other in their series history. Both games ended with the same score, 23-17. The Steelers won the first game in 1997 after Jerome Bettis scored on a screen pass from Cordell Stewart. And in 2005, the Jaguars won on a pick six by cornerback Rasheen Mathis off of a Tommy Maddox pass. All right, let's get into this game a little bit. We just talked about the Jaguars' defense and how it's pretty much the same personnel, but they just aren't performing the way they had most of last season. But statistically, they're still a really good pass defense. What what did the Steelers need to do to hang up some points on them? Uh, so here's the deal. Going off of what Josh said, I really think the problem has been, for the Jaguars, the pressure. And the sacks. So all the Steelers have to do is not uh, change that for the Jaguars. Uh, it's terrible for, for the Jaguars coming in, and great for the Steelers because of, because of their weakness. For what they were last year with 55 sacks, they've been terrible in that department uh, thus far with only 19 sacks 10, week, uh, 10 weeks in. Like, that's awful. Uh, with seven games left to go, they're only on pace for 34 sacks. And uh, going against the Steelers line definitely isn't going to help them as the offensive line has played lights out recently, even without Marcus Gilbert. Since week five against the Atlanta Falcons, the Steelers have only allowed three sacks, and one was taken purposely against Baltimore. So if you want to get technical, the O-line really uh, has only allowed two actual sacks. Still, though, uh, the the tackles are going to have the hardest job in this one as only two Jaguars players have more than one sack, which is really interesting to me. It's such a weird distribution. There's five sacks from Kalias Campbell and five sacks from uh, Yannick Ngakoue. Uh, and then the only other Jaguars player that has two sacks is now a Rams player, and that's Dante Fowler. Everyone else that has a sack for the Jaguars only has one. So I, I found that interesting. I didn't think that that was true when I first looked at it. I thought the site was wrong. But 
Uh, not only that, though, uh, Campbell's been a tackle machine. This, uh, he's leading all defensive linemen in the league with tackles and is third on the team with tackles. And just to put it in perspective, he has 43 combined tackles. That's as much as linebacker T.J. Watt had. So that, he's playing at an incredible pace for his position. Uh, so uh, Villanueva is likely going to have it, the toughest challenge of the year here. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see how he handles it. Uh, but that's really the only weak spot that Jaguar, Jaguars have, if I'm being honest. The other one I can say is that they've been pretty susceptible to the run this season, but they've abs- they absolutely shut down Marlon Mack and Naeem Hines last, uh, last game. So I don't really know what to think of them. They're still averaging 118.6 rush yards per game given up, which ranks 19th in the league. So maybe that's ideal for James Conner, but I'm not – Sure, really, because I like their defensive line with Ngakwe, Malik Jackson, Marshall Darius, and Clyus Campbell. And then I also like Miles Jack and Talvin Smith as run stoppers. So I don't really feel that great, even after looking at the statistics. Uh, as for the passing game, the Jaguars have been pretty locked down. They're number one pass defense in terms of pass yards per game, and that was without having uh, A.J. Boye for a little bit. So I would give them credit for that. And uh, Jalen Ramsey is still good despite people saying he's trash on Twitter and stuff. The, uh, the team is losing, and he has stopped running his mouth, but it's not his fault they are losing. Uh, as for the safeties, they actually may be another weak spot. I mean, statistically, the numbers say they're good, but I'm really not sold on Barry Church and Sean Gibson. I really think it's the cornerbacks who are doing most of the work to make them the best pass defense. So uh, I wouldn't mind if Ben was able to attack them. Uh, after if somehow the wide receivers beat the cornerbacks. Honestly, though, even though Boye has been great, we saw from last year that Brown has the advantage in that matchup. Anyway, so I don't expect a slowdown from Brown, but just like in the playoff game, I expect Juju to be uh, pretty locked down. Uh, again, though, the Jaguars don't really have their good uh, cornerback three anymore in Colvin. It's either DJ Hayden or uh, Patman as their number three. It's depending on what they're feeling, really. And I'll say this for the fifth week in a row. This is another ideal matchup for James Washington. Uh, we need to see him step up. And Juju is going to be blanket all day by either Boye or Ramsey. Him or Switzer. But as John and I discussed on the last podcast, Switzer is a situational guy for the most part. So we're not likely going to see that out of him. Uh, another matchup that I like, and Josh actually alluded to it in his comments, where the Jaguars have been pretty weak against solid tight ends. And we all know the Steelers Titans are having a great year together, and Vance can easily destroy here if the wide receivers aren't able to do much. Uh, not ruling Jesse out either. I believe either of those two can eat when they're doing reds, so that's just going to be something to watch. So tight end battle versus uh, the Jaguars defense who have been struggling against tight ends this year. So what do the Steelers have to do in your mind to win this game? On offense. Well, they need to be able to uh, – this is going to be my key for really every every game. It's really the key, but especially for this one because the Steelers lost the battle of the line of scrimmage in both games. The offensive line needs to make sure that they handle their business up front. And, yeah, we can talk about the fact that the pass rush hasn't been very good and they haven't been consistently getting sacks, but – it's still the you know many of the names are still the same and that's still scary you know just because it's not as good as we've seen it in the past doesn't mean they can't break out you know the jaguars will continue to use their four man pass rush you have to be able to give ben roethlisberger time in this one this is a very important test for matt filer he's held up very well this year but this is another important test for him so i want to see how he performs uh, the cornerbacks in Ramsey and Boye, as you mentioned, they're still very good. Don't expect a ton of separations for the receivers, especially Smith Schuster, like you said. This could be a big game for the tight ends uh, and James Conner out of the backfield. If you may remember in the playoff game, Vance McDonald had 10 catches for 115 yards. That was the first time we kind of saw some good things out of McDonald in that game. I'm not sure if we'll see 10 catches again, but I would be encouraged to see him being used in this one. The safeties have not been very good for the Jaguars. J- Barry Church, especially, Josh highlighted him, and he hasn't. He, he has struggled a lot. Telvin Smith is banged up, and although he's leading the team in coverage, he hasn't been himself and has been susceptible in pass defense on this season. I, I'm also curious to see just how much the Steelers go after whoever Antonio Brown is matched up with. In the playoff game last year, Brown Brown was very effective, but this year, we've kind of seen that 
Roethlisberger will go away from Brown at times, and he's not going to lock onto him. I wonder if that'll help or hurt the Steelers overall in this game because Brown is the man, but at the same time, maybe you, you don't want to force it to him. That caused, caused some turnovers last year. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we should be sold on necessarily a huge game for Brown. What do you think? Well, I honestly think that uh, Antonio Brown is going to win this matchup. I I do think he's going to have a big game because of his matchup with AJ Boye. Like last year, AJ Boye didn't allow a touchdown all season, and then Antonio Brown came in and had two on him. So I feel like Antonio Brown will still have a big game here, but maybe not like. Maybe not like, let's see, where do I want to put it? Because, I mean, Antonio Brown this year hasn't been, like, hasn't been like Antonio Brown. He hasn't been putting up those numbers. I mean, he's got the touchdown numbers. So maybe Antonio Brown could get the two touchdowns, but maybe his yards only total, like, 90. So, like, that's, that's where I would put it at, probably. Maybe he could get the two touchdowns, I believe, and then just only 90 yards, maybe. Okay. I just wanted to get kind of a gauge on where you how how good you thought the uh, potential big game for him would be. Uh, another thing, I, I know the Steelers struggled at times last year, but I still think you can run the ball in this defense. They are 19th against the run, as Austin mentioned, and if you can run the ball, that'll really help. I have a feeling the Jaguars are going to load the box, though, and they're going to try to take their chances with their guys in one-on-one -on -one coverage at times. And you need to be able to show that you can run the ball there. Especially if Marcel Darius doesn't play. He's their best run stopper. The Jaguars are certainly going to load the box if that happens. You have to be able to run the ball at least effectively enough to keep them honest. And for Ben Roethlisberger, the formula for him, he's just got to look at the most recent game against the Ravens just two weeks ago. He didn't really take a ton of shots downfield. He took the smart plays underneath, and he was accurate and precise with his short passes. The dink and dunk approach, it's not going to get you those big quick strike touchdowns. You may only get 23, 24 points on offense, but I think it's going to take something similar to that kind of approach against this athletic defense to not only score points, but to not turn the ball over and give the Jaguars chances to to get points off of those turnovers. And as we know, last year, turnovers killed the Steelers against Jacksonville. So I think the offense needs to be, they need to be able to stay balanced and they need to be not too aggressive when it comes to attacking this athletic secondary. On defense, it's we talked about it. It's a relatively simple formula for the Jaguars offense, but Leonard Fournette coming back really helps them. Do you think that they finally explode? Because the Jaguars have only gone over 20 points just once in the past five games. Well, I'm not going to say that this is going to be the game that they they come back. Because I really don't think that this offense is a good one. Even with Fournette back, you get one step forward and two steps back. You lose Brian Linder for the season who's been one of their best run-blocking uh on the, one of their best run blockers on the line. So, regardless, the rest of the defense is interesting. Josh mentioned how it's just been a revolving door at the offensive line, and it's really bad for them right now. Despite having this constant change, they've still been pretty decent in pass blocking, only allowing 22 sacks, which ranks 13th in the league, which is uh, modest for a team that's just been so injured. And then, uh, however, they haven't really been great at run blocking, allowing only four yards of carry, which is tied for 24th in the league. And that's, that stays the same this game. I don't think they're uh, – I because they – like I said, I literally said it a second ago, they took one step forward, two steps back. They got Fournette back, which is an improvement over T.J. Yeldon, but they lost Brian Linder. So they, they're – basically their yards uh, their yards for carry that they allow is probably going to stay the same. But uh, going along with Brian Linder, uh, which – who they lost in the year – Joe Walker won't be playing this game, meaning Eric Flowers will be starting this game. And this is against one of the most deadly pass rushing units in the league, if not the most deadly. Right now they rank second in sacks, and it's only because they could probably have first right now. The, the team in first is the Packers, and they got to play an extra game. So likely the Steelers come back. I mean, but I mean, the Steelers are tied with the Chiefs and Vikings for second most sacks, too. So we'll see what happens after this week. But, uh, Bud Dupree gets to continue his streak of playing against very weak tackles and gets gets 
Eric Flowers, who, if he's still the guy he was on the Giants, couldn't block a toddler waddling at an aggressively average speed. So uh, there is a chance that he has gotten better coaching from Pat Flattery, uh, Flat Hurdy, I'm sorry, uh, the Jaguars' O-line coach, and also might have uh, had improved getting to uh, practice against better guys, but likely not. Likely this is still the Eric Flowers that the Giants fans came to know and hate a lot. But uh, the rest of the line isn't in the best shape either. Ken is a little banged up coming in. Parnell is okay. Norwell is good. And uh, obviously having Tyler Shatley start at center isn't ideal. So really I'm looking for the passers to really get at them this game from all over. But uh, let's talk about coverage matchups. Uh, this is weird to say, but for once, I think Cody Sensible has an advantage on all the wide receivers on the field. I think very lowly of the Jaguars wide receivers, besides Chark because I am biased towards him, as I liked him pre-draft. He was one of the wide receivers I looked at. Uh, I just was never sold on Moncrief being a number one wide receiver. He was always great as a number two in Indy, but, like, it's just it's not good that he's the number one right now. To be fair to the Jags, he wasn't supposed to be. Like I already mentioned, Marquis Lee got hurt before the season started, but still, this is what they're left with now. And as Josh said, Q and Cole really hasn't lived up to, the, uh, to fans' expectations. And look at his stats. He's really not looking that great. Again, it seems like he could be a nice side piece to a team uh, with a great wide receiver, but not as arguably their best. I mean, it, it's pretty rough. Um, that really just leaves Westbrook. And I find Westbrook to be interesting. I think he's a great young guy that's still developing and could be great next year. So maybe watch out for him. Uh, still, though, I think Cody is at least equal to all these guys mentioned. So for Hilton and Hayden, this should be light work. Uh, as for the tight ends, uh, which Steelers have struggled with in the past, they have been virtually non-factors for the Jags with O'Shaughnessy, Niles Paul, Safarian Jenkins, David Greenwich, and Blake, Balcom, Blake Bell, I'm sorry, combining for 44 catches for 436 yards and three touchdowns over the nine games they, they played. So that's roughly less than five catches a game and less than 49 yards a game from all five of their tight ends combined. Uh, this should be good for whatever person is assigned to them. I really kind of hope it's Edmonds. Uh, I hope he gets to see them a lot because I feel like it will really help build his confidence and help him like learn how to cover tight ends better. Uh, but likely it, that matchup's not going to be happening very often. You don't really see that very often. It's going to be... Uh, a lot of the tight ends match up on linebackers. But uh, speaking of linebackers, I hope the Steelers continue to use the inside ones on blitzes because it's been working well the past couple of weeks. And without their starting center, the Jags are, be uh, are begging to be attacked in the middle. So I hope to see Bostic or Williams get a sack in this one. Uh, I'm also going to be looking for John Hargrave to do his thing. Hopefully he could step up in the wake of two of being out this game. Two would have absolutely been huge the past few games with pressure and sacks. So we can only really hope Hargrave and Hayward either make up for it, or Alualu steps up and gets uh, and does big things against his former team, which is possible. You always play more pissed off when you play your former team, but then again, last year uh, the Steelers played the Jaguars twice, and I don't really remember anything super big coming from Alualu, but we'll see. So, what do you have to say about the defense coming into this game? Well, you highlighted it pretty well, and starting up front. They are really banged up. And Eric Flowers starting a, a tackle has got to be something the Steelers are licking their chops at. Whether it's Watt on the outside or whether it's Bud Dupree, most likely Dupree considering where they've been lining up this year, you really want to see him have a great game. And you think about Dupree, his only struggle the last few weeks has been not finishing sacks. This would be an important game to do so because the only thing that bodes well for Eric Flowers besides – kind of starting out a, you know, a fresh change of scenery is the fact that Blake Bortles is far more mobile than Eli Manning ever has or ever will be or ever was. So the fact remains, the Steelers have struggled in containing quarterbacks for the most part this year, and Bortles hurt them last year. So you want to make sure that he gets taken care of, and you want to make sure that you not only rush him, pressure him, but don't let him escape. And just because the offensive line hasn't been great and they're injured, it doesn't mean they can't beat you. We didn't think think that they were that great last year, and they absolutely mauled the Steelers' defensive line twice, especially in the playoffs. Especially with Stefan Tuitt out, they need to be ready to stop the run because, as we know, how the running game goes will determine how the Jaguars' offense is, for the most part, on any given day. 
Uh, the ground game, as we talked about, it suffered greatly, but now they have three healthy and quality running backs in Carlos Hyde, TJ Yeldon, and Leonard Fournette. Fournette, we need no introduction for him. He's a bruising runner. He's dynamic. He's had great games against the Steelers twice. Carlos Hyde is a similar type player, but not as dynamic, and he was ineffective in the Browns' week one tie with the Steelers. Him, He was obviously traded to the Jaguars since then. And TJ Yeldon is the third down back who can run on the outside and catch passes out of the backfield. They need to make sure they have all three accounted for. Vince Williams and John Bostic have both been very good the last few weeks, but I have a feeling they'll be matched up on running backs at times in this game. And uh, we saw Christian McCaffrey go off for three touchdowns last week. That can't happen again this week. Uh, the passing game for the Jacksonville Jaguars is not in great shape. Some of it is Blake Bortles, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that he hasn't had as good of protection as he had last year. And on top of that, we already talked about it. They're missing Marquise Lee. They don't really have an established number one receiver. A few proven guys in Dante Moncrief and D.D. Westbrook have been okay, but they haven't been great. And then other wideouts, Keenan Cole, he's disappointed. And DJ Chark is just a rookie. And you already talked about their tight ends. They actually re-signed Ben Koyak, who played uh, in a couple playoff games last year. They, they're they really hurting a tight end. They, they, they've got a, a bunch of trouble there. They don't really have any standout players on, on the offense this year. And they didn't last year either, and they still, they, they still had a good game against the Steelers. But you think about their struggles at receiver, I think this is going to be a game that's all about the ground game, and it's going to be all about Blake Bortles taking check downs and going for the tight ends. The Steelers need to make sure they have them covered up with linebackers and safeties. They're going to have to be active all day because I think the perimeter passing game is going to be pretty quiet with the exception of play action passes. So they need to be ready for the run, ready for the play action, and expect a lot of passes to go to the running backs and tight ends. Overall, this offense is just not very dynamic, and they have a specific formula that they need to have in order to have a good day. And uh, we just talked about it. The only way to get Blake Bortles really in rhythm is to run the ball effectively, use it to set up the play action. So the Steelers need to first and foremost stop the run, plain and simple. And I think they can do that. But it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a lot harder than I think we all thought it was last year and we figured they were probably going to do it. But they didn't. As far as special teams goes, what's this matchup looking like? Well, I went with a very statistical approach for uh, this preview. Jaguars have the advantage on kick returns, where they average 20.6 yards per return to the Steelers, 19.6. Likely on the coverage team is their net punt is 39 yards per punt, while the Steelers is 38.1. And then in terms of field goals, where they have hit 14 of 15 field goals with a long of 57, compared to the Steelers only having hit 8 of 11 with a long of 50. Uh, conversely, the Steelers have the advantage on punt returns where they average 10.4 yards per return to the Jaguars, 6.5. Uh, punting, where it's 42.5 yards per punt from the Steelers and 39 yards per punt from the Jaguars. And finally, kickoffs, where uh, the Steelers are averaging 63.1 yards per kickoff compared to the Jaguars, 61.3. So what do you have to add about special teams? Jaden Minkins and DJ Chark have both been really good on kick returns this year. You talked about them. They're both averaging over 24 yards per return this season. The punt return game has been much more quiet. Besides a 23-yard return by D.D. Westbrook, the Jaguars are averaging just over 5 yards per punt return as a team. Uh, That's really all I have to add. Their kicker, Josh Lambeau, has been very good. He was the last kicker to be perfect on the season before I believe he missed a kick last week, too. All right, keys for keys to the game. Uh, give me both your offensive and defensive key for the Pittsburgh Steelers. For offense, it's to take the low-hanging fruit. If the tight ends are open and the wide receivers aren't, focus on the tight end. If the run game is working and the pass game isn't, stick with running until they stop it. Uh, I feel like that's a simple one. And for defense, I felt like saying cause pressure would be taking the easy way out for me. I think as I use this key like four times so far. So I'm going to say force some turnovers and said, I didn't really talk about Bortles much, but he has thrown eight interceptions and uh, the team has fumbled the ball four times. So it's really not the hardest ask in the world. So what are your keys for offense and defense? Speaking of turnovers on offense, it's this time don't turn the football over. They had seven turnovers in two games against Jacksonville last year. 
the def- yeah, the defense really struggled too, especially in the playoff game, but six interceptions, a fumble, three of those turnovers were returned for touchdowns on the same play. That cannot happen. The Jaguars' offense likely is not good enough to drive 70-plus yards for touchdowns more than twice in this game. Don't make it easy for them to put up points. On defense, I talked about winning the line of scrimmage before, but for the defense, it's important. The Jaguars' uh, offensive line clearly won the battle. 72 total rushes between the two games last year. The Jaguars had 395 rushing yards. And yes, I know 90 came on one play, and Bortles had six runs on his own, but that's still a good average yards per carry there. Not to mention the Steelers had over two, only two sacks in those games, and they barely touched Bortles at all in the playoffs, especially when you consider that Stefan Tuitt, who has been red hot in this one uh, the last few weeks, he's not going to be playing. The line needs to step up. You need big games from Cam Hayward, Javon Hargrave, and Tyson Alawalu, not to mention the fact that LT Walton and Daniel McCullers will both be active in this game as well. And as far as X factors go, I'll just give you mine right away, Austin. On offense, it's Vance McDonald. He had 10 catches in the playoff game back in January. The Jaguars, as we know, have good talent on the defensive perimeter. This is an important game for McDonald and really the tight ends in general with the struggles of Barry Church and Telvin Smith this year. You really like to think that McDonald can find some open room in this one. And on defense, I went with Tyson Alualu. I really could have gone with any of the def- starters on the defensive line, but I'm going with Alualu for a few reasons. Because he's not a starter. This is his former team that he's playing against. But most importantly, because in his NFL career, his calling card has been that he's a solid run defender. And he has he's not a great pass rusher, but he can do it on occasion. He needs to be the fill-in guy, the rotational guy that can step up and handle the load that the Steelers signed him to be last season. So this will be an important game for him. Who are your X factors on offense and defense? For offense, it's Villanueva. He seems like a clear one for me. He is the hardest matchup of all the offensive players, in my opinion, uh, rushing against Clive Campbell for most of the day. So I'm making him my X factor. Uh, As for defense, Bud Dupree. Dupree gets to go against Eric Flowers. I think he could actually do some damage here if Eric Flowers is still as bad as he was. So, yeah. All right, into the pick'em section. It is week 11 of the NFL season, and we already talked about the Thursday night game. Let's get into the 1 o'clock games. The Dallas Cowboys in Atlanta. The Falcons getting 3.5 points at home. I was actually, I originally had the Cowboys to win this one outright, but I'm actually going to change the pick to the Falcons covering the covering the point spread, the three and a half, because I, I actually took a look at Matt Ryan's home and road splits. I, I don't have them up in front of me, but he's playing at an unbelievable level at home right now. I think he only has one interception. And although the matchup really should favor the, the Cowboys because the struggles with the Falcons' defense and stopping the run and the Cowboys running the ball... I don't know. This is kind of my last-ditch chance to pick the Falcons here. I'm going to go with the Cowboys. I just am not sold on the Falcons. I think the Falcons are my new uh, favorite bird team to hate on because I've been walking away from the Seahawks, and I just the the amount of love the Falcons get and everything pisses me off because they're a bad team. So I'm going to pick the Cowboys to win outright. The Carolina Panthers going to Detroit to face the Lions, who practiced in the snow for some reason. Did you see that? I did. I did see that they practiced in the snow, and Matt Patricia was defending it. I'm not sure I understand the logic behind it, considering that they don't play a game outdoors for like another month, but okay. Uh, I'm still going to take the Panthers. Give me the four and a half points here that they're favored on the road. Yeah, there must have been something going on in their head because they also brought Nathan Peterman in for a tryout t- uh, today. So there's something going wrong in there. But I'm going to pick Carolina to cover. I thought their spread was a little too close, even though the Lions are home. I think I would have picked Carolina by seven. So uh, Carolina covers. The Tennessee Titans fresh off a win against the Patriots go to Indianapolis to face the rising Colts. Indy's getting a point and a half at home. Give me the Colts and Andrew Luck. I think that they've been an improving team. And the way the offensive line has played the last few weeks, I think they're going to continue to control the line of scrimmage and the Colts will come out on top. So give me the Colts, lay the one and a half. 
Yeah, I might see the Colts cover too. It's just a bad matchup for the Titans here, where the Titans don't really have that good of a pass rush, and the Colts' offensive line is done so stellar. Uh, so I'm going to pick the Colts cover. Tampa Bay Buccaneers at the New York Giants. The Giants getting one and a half at home. Give me Eli to have uh, have another win in this one. The Buccaneers put up 500 yards last week but didn't manage to score. If they do that again, they'll probably win. But I don't think the Giants are as bad as everyone seems to think. So I'll take the Giants to cover the one-and-a-half-point spread. I'm going to take the Buccaneers. I think the Buccaneers are a mess, but I think I, I am one of those people that thinks the Giants are really a dumpster fire. So I'm going to pick the Buccaneers to win. Texans at Redskins. The Texans getting th- uh, three on the road. Uh, I should have picked the Redskins last week, and I'm picking against them this week just because I I really feel like it was just patchwork. They, they were kind of lucky to get away with the win last week, and I don't think they'll be lucky again this week. Give me Deshaun Watson and the Texans off the bye to cover the three-point spread. This isn't Tampa Bay's defense line anymore, Toto. Uh, this is going to be a real big boy offense, uh, well, not offensive, defensive line that they're going against, and I don't think that the Redskins are fit to handle it. So I'm picking Houston to cover. I am checking right now to see if there's an updated line for the Bengals and Ravens game because I know I think it's four. I think I think you. Uh, I know you have it written down. I think they have it at four because I went to ESPN like right right before we started this. I think that they actually have it at four with them splitting reps. All right, then. In that case, I'll take uh, the Bengals to win this one outright. I know they've really struggled lately, but I I can't trust a team that's splitting snaps between quarterbacks, especially when they can't trust their first-round pick, Lamar Jackson. So give me the Bengals to win this one. Uh, I'm going to pick the Ravens to win, 24-23. Uh, to 23. I think it's going to be a close game, but uh, I think that I think that it's, it's just – I don't really know. I just want want to be different. So I'm going to pick the uh, Raven, uh, the Bengals plus four. Another tank bowl. This time it's the Oakland Raiders at the Arizona Cardinals. Arizona's getting five and a half at home. Uh, who wins the tank bowl? This is rough for me. I really it's like I I feel like both teams are really bad. The Cardinals. <sighs> kind of help the Raiders because the Raiders don't have any pass rush and then Arizona doesn't have any offensive line to make up for that. So like, I feel like I want to pick, I want to pick Arizona to cover. I, I feel like that, that they have the better players. So th- therefore they should win. I, I think so. We're going to, I'm going to pick Arizona. Who do you have? I actually think the Raiders have the better overall players. So I actually think the Raiders are going to win this one. And the fact that the Cardinals have two wins this season, they've both come against the 49ers minus Jimmy Garoppolo, which is meaningless to me. And yeah, you could say the Raiders have the one win against the Browns, but whatever. I don't know. I, I'd stay away from this one, I guess is what I'm saying. But I'm just going to pick the Raiders just for uh, just for giggles, just for fun, I guess. I have no confidence in it. Uh, Denver Broncos at the LA Chargers. The Chargers getting seven points. This is a one of those weird AFC West games. I I got burned on this earlier in the season where I thought the I thought the Chargers were going to run away with the game, and it ended up being closer than I thought it was going to be. So this time I'll take the Broncos plus seven. I still think the Chargers are a better football team and will come away with the win. Von Miller has been at his best in his NFL career against the Chargers. Don't forget that. I'm going to take that into account and still pick the Chargers to cover because the rest of the Broncos are trash. So I'm going to take the Chargers to cover. Philadelphia Eagles, their season is on the line just about. Going to New Orleans, the Saints, the NFL's best team right now, getting eight points at home. I'll take the Eagles plus eight. I think they're desperate and that, that championship medal will be shown, but the Eagles are just not good enough and the Saints are the best team in football. So give me the Eagles plus eight. The Eagles just look terrible for me. I re- I couldn't. I Like, I thought about it because of their season's on the line, but, like, I think it's already too far gone at this point. So I'm going to pick the Saints to cover. I think the Saints are going to beat them up. Sunday night football and NFC North clash. The Minnesota Vikings go to Chicago to take on the Bears in a battle for the top of uh, the NFC North. 
I'm going to take the Vikings to win this one outright. The Bears getting two and a half at home. I just, when it comes down to it, I don't really trust either quarterback a lot, but I tr- trust Kirk Cousins more than I trust Mitchell Trubisky. I'm going to take the Bears to cover. I feel like Trubisky has been playing out of his mind. I feel like he's really developed in the second season. And uh, I really like the Bears' defense, especially with the return of the Mac. So I, I like the Bears to win, uh, win and cover here. Monday Night Football could be the game of the year if you love offense. The Chiefs and Rams certainly have a lot of it. Uh, neither team has been playing defense particularly effectively at all this year. This game was originally supposed to be played in Mexico City, but has been moved to the L.A. Coliseum. The Rams were two-and-a-half-point favorites in Mexico City, now three-and-a-half-point favorites at home. We talked about this a bit before, but I think, Austin, I, I think the Chiefs, I just I trust them a little more right now. I, I have some questions about the Rams. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the Chiefs went out right here. I, I'm I'm a little bit low on the Rams right now as, as a team. I feel like they're just not as good as advertised is the best way to say it right now. So I'm going to say Chiefs went out right. Especially when you consider that Cooper Cup has been lost for the season too. They're not bad. They're not in trouble. But I don't think they're quite as good as we once thought. All right, so on Sunday, the Steelers taking on the Jaguars. 1 p.m. Give me your bold predictions for this game. Well, I, I think Bud Dupree has two sacks and a pass defense. Kalias Campbell gets no sacks or tackles for a loss in this game. And then Boswell hits five field goals. What are your bold predictions? I think the Steelers are going to run a fake punt, and it's going to be successful in this game. Steelers haven't done that in a, quite a long time. And I think Javon Hargrave has his first career multi-sack game in the NFL. He's already set a career high in sacks this season. And I think he'll continue to enhance that in this game. All right, so from top to bottom, we've looked at this game, Austin. There's a a lot of things to like if you're the Steelers. There's a lot of things to still be concerned about. Remember, we thought the Steelers were going to win both games last year, and they ended up losing both. So, again, I think we're talking the Steelers should win this game, but just because they should doesn't mean they will, and they haven't. Uh, They haven't beaten the Jaguars since 2014, this will be their third crack at them since. They're getting five points in Jacksonville, which I think could be a little too much. I don't know. Where are you leaning on this one? Uh, well, I feel like it's going to be a close matchup, like I said. I think it's going to end 29-26 in the Steelers' favor. I think that the Jaguars are going to keep it within that five-point spread, uh, but I feel like it's going to be closer than, than most people would think coming in. So 29-26. Jags plus five. I'll also take the Jaguars plus five, but I think the Steelers get out to a lead early enough that they can stay ahead. I think maybe they jump out to a 10 to three or, you know, uh, maybe a 17 to three, 17 to 10 lead enough to keep them in good shape on offense so that they can stay balanced while the Jaguars have to throw the ball a little bit. I think this will be a tough game. It'll be close. It'll be one of those games. I, this has the makings of a trap game. Uh, I'll be honest with you. The whole narrative of the Steelers struggling, playing down to their competition on the road, has kind of eroded the past few years, especially because the Steelers have only one road loss their last two seasons in Chicago after the whole National Anthem debacle. But I think that, I don't know, if the Steelers can win this game and win it with you know win it well playing good football does that narrative die for you completely i feel like it should because this is a really hard uh matchup in terms of like what the past between these two teams so i feel like you could put that narrative to rest if they could just win this one here i'll i'll definitely agree with you if they can play solid football and can come away with a quality win i'll i'll have seen enough and i think they'll come away with the win but I think they'll be sloppy, kind of like we saw it coming out of the bye against the Colts last year. And not that the Jaguars are a bad football team, but they haven't been their best this year. But I think they'll play really well this time. But it's not going to be enough. I think the Steelers hold out just a slim 24-21 to 21 victory. So I'll take the Jaguars plus 5 in this one. So I have the Steelers moving to 7-2-1, and one, Austin, and so do you. Uh, do you have any final thoughts on this game? Uh, No, I think we covered it pretty good. How about you? Nope, I'm good to go. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today on the Stronger Than Steel podcast. If you have any questions about the show, feel free to email us at strongerthansteelpodcast at gmail.com. I want to give a shout out to my friend Josh Farnsworth for joining us again uh, this season, talking a little bit about the Jaguars and Steelers. I uh, always appreciate having him on. He's a good dude. And uh, although, you know, he's a great person to talk to, I'll be, you know, we'll be rooting against his team this week, but uh, hoping for the best for his team uh, from, you know, Monday on out. But uh, until then, thank you as always for listening to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. Have a great night. Have a good night. You have been listening to Stronger Than Steel podcast. Thank you for joining us today.